I always treasure these times, uh, as you know, uh, to be with my church, uh, the brothers and sisters, uh, the saints in Irvine. And uh, this morning I've been, uh, I shouldn't say struggling, but very much debating and considering what to say in, uh, in 45 minutes. Um, to be truthful with you, I'm still not so sure as I'm here. <clears throat> but um, on the other hand, I must admit that uh, there's some feelings uh, percolating or present uh, in me for some time. Perhaps I will just be free and take, take this time of, I would consider a family time, a family talk uh, with my own family um, <clears throat> to uh, say something uh, more freely according to <clears throat> that feeling of mine. Uh, Rich referring to us emerging from this two year old uh, pandemic. And um, I go back to two years ago and uh, uh, you know, when we began the lockdowns and uh, self quarantine and you know, so many things. Um, this uh, kind of a worldwide uh, pandemic, <clears throat> um, I wouldn't call it a plague, but certainly a very, very uh, rare um, um, event um, in, in history. Not that this has not happened before, but uh, with the the size of the world's population with the interconnectedness of nations in the, with the ease of transportation and also of course, uh, uh, communication. Uh, <clears throat> such a um, uh, pandemic um, impacted all, the, all of our lives greatly. And <clears throat> Not only was there the pandemic, but you know, for us who are living in the United States in the last two years, uh, all kinds of things happen. I mean, I almost lost count. It's like a little bit of a blur, almost a bit of a nightmare in the last two years uh, in society, in politics, in uh, even today, the economy in so many uh, things, um, uh, serious, serious things and serious, serious problems that have, uh, that is besetting uh, our country. And um, then just as we are, uh, so to speak, uh, coming out of that, we find on the other side of the world, um, a terrible, terrible human conflict between nations. Um, well, you may say that's just a little country. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's not close to us. But again, I say in the uh, connectedness of the world as a small village anymore, um, <clears throat> and with all the daily bombardment and uh, of uh, news of uh, stories of images and all the rest. Uh, sometimes one may even feel like this war is going on maybe next door to me. That's the kind of uh, sensation you might have. And along with that kind of a uh, um, um, situation, uh, comes the um, um, the alarm, the disturbance, the unrest. Um, I would even say the fear and the uh, uh, 
sense of uh, uh, danger. And uh, <clears throat> um, all of this, all of this um, became almost like uh, a part of our lives. And um, then for us uh, in the churches in this country, something uh, like uh, what happened uh, less than a month ago with this um, great tragedy took place in the uh, church, in, in, in fact, indeed the meeting hall of the uh, church in Sacramento uh, of this shooting, which result, resulted in the death of five uh, saints, one of whom is the shooter and his three children, girls, and, um, and a very, very dear brother and elder of the church there, <clears throat> Brother Nat Kong. Um, <clears throat> one wonders where is a safe place anymore? Um, things, how can things like, things like that happen? In, in our own uh, assembly place. Um, again, it just hit home very, very closely. And um, again, causing just uh, a lot of uh, um, tumult in our soul uh, and in our, uh, in the, on the inside. And so, um, this is not even to mention uh, how many regular, uh, may I say normal, goings on in our personal lives. Um, because we're all uh, are in our own environment, um, and which is part of the all things in Romans 8 allowed by God. Um, all things meaning persons, matters, situations, uh, environment at large, um, ordained by God for those who love him and are called according to his purpose uh, to conform us to the Lord's image. And those environmental things uh, often becomes quite a dealing to us. Um, uh, it could be um, um, a loss uh, of, uh, of loved ones. It could be um, the, uh, the uh, challenge of our health condition. Um, it could be um, um, all manners of things that would happen uh, in our lives as part of God's necessary dealing and uh, even according to his um, governmental uh, 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 order. And so these sufferings that we face, uh, all of us would face, um, um, have a way of um, 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 also uh, uh, giving rise to inner turmoil. Um, these sufferings and afflictions uh, would cause us to not have peace. And again, uh, to even be quite consumed with all kinds of anxieties. As if that is not enough, uh, you have <clears throat> uh, God's enemy who is ever provoked uh, uh, to be against us because of God's love for us and, and, um, and God's uh, purpose for us. So he is a provoked, uh, as in the case of Job in the Old Testament, 
to accuse uh, the saints of God, um, to attack them, to be even uh, uh, send uh, uh, relentless barrages of, uh, of uh, fiery darts in the way of thoughts and, and uh, doubts and uh, 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 threats and, uh, and all kinds of things. Um, and even sometimes even attacking our physical bodies. Um, this is something from Satan, the one who aims to wear out God's saints. And then you have the world at large. Um, um, the Lord Jesus, uh, when asked by the, the disciples uh, about what is going to happen, what the future, uh, how is it all going to end this world? Well, the Lord uh, told them the truth. Um, you know, of course, he was speaking to the Jewish disciples, believers, but talk about uh, the destruction that will come to Jerusalem, which took place. You talk about uh, there will be, this is after the Lord's ascension, not just at the end of this age, but in the beginning of this New Testament age, there would be wars, nations against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms. Uh, there will be earthquakes, there will be pestilence. You recall those three horses uh, as the uh, uh, fifth seal, uh, as the first seals in Revelation of, uh, of war, uh, of um, um, deaths, right, uh, of um, uh, famine and so on, all bringing forth great suffering and death. And not only so, all this eventually will end in uh, three and a half years of what is called the Great Tribulation, uh, the kind of uh, uh, destruction, even supernaturally, as uh, this world has never seen as part of God's judgment. And, and uh, the Lord told the disciples, um, because the world persecutes me, they will also persecute you. He predicted uh, the persecution of Christians, um, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, a very, very um, um, uh, dark uh, outlook, a very uh, black picture. Um, and so in that, with that as a background, there's just something within me. Um, how are we going to uh, handle ourselves? How are we going to face these things uh, from, uh, uh, you may say, from God's direction? Uh, from Satan's direction, uh, from the environmental direction, and often even from within our soul, uh, our thoughts and our hearts uh, being quite disturbed uh, and disquieted. So uh, what is the feeling that I have within me? The feeling within me is that um, uh, against these things and because of these things. And we need to um, have a way uh, to still uh, go on, <clears throat> to live uh, our human life, and for sure to live our Christian life, to live Christ to live Christ, <clears throat> and then to live the church life as God has ordained that we do. And especially here in the Lord's dear recovery, uh, which has something uh, to do with God's uh, economy, God's uh, work and move in the last of this age. Um, to work out something to bring his will to the earth, his kingdom to the earth, uh, and even himself 
uh, back to this earth. And so what are we to do uh, in this situation? It is not easy, I would agree with you. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, there would be a lot to talk about and fellowship about, but this morning, I just want to talk to you just from this angle, and that is the angle of peace, and particularly the peace of God, the peace of Christ. And in fact, in fact, uh, when we talk about the peace of God or the peace of Christ, the real meaning is that Christ as the peace and God as our peace. This is greatly needed in these days for our going on. <clears throat> Humanly and spiritually, individually and collectively. In the epistles uh, <clears throat> written uh, in the New Testament, um, uh, more often than not, the writer would um, in the, the beginning salutation say something like, <clears throat> grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace is the standard greetings from the apostles to the churches, implying that amongst many things, uh, these are the two constants that the believers need in order to carry on, <clears throat> in order to practice the church life according to the will of God. Now, grace, we know, in its most intrinsic meaning, uh, is absolutely not just some unmerited favor, uh, given to God to us, and certainly not about the uh, physical things that God, that, that we may be gifted or that we may receive. Grace is simply the triune God embodied in Christ as the Spirit today to become our full enjoyment and our all-inclusive supply. That is grace. And so <clears throat> even at the end of the Bible, the end of the New Testament, the end of the last book in the New Testament revelation, it ends with none other than this, grace, of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. So today, we firstly need the grace of God. That means we cannot do it. We cannot uh, endure all these afflictions and sufferings that comes our way. Um, we need another source of supply, we need another source of help. And that would be the very God himself. But this morning, my burden is not on, on grace, as critical as that is. I want to concentrate or focus on the issue, the first result, uh, of a person or a saint or a church that is partaking of this wonderful, multiplied, and all grace of God. And that issue is simply peace. Peace is a direct result of our enjoyment of the triune God. If we say, we're enjoying God, 
and we have no peace, then we need to put a question mark on that enjoyment. When we truly experience Christ in the deepest way, when we really partake of all that he is in, in, in his unsearchably, unsearchable riches, the result should be a condition of peace. Actually, this condition of peace would allow us to enjoy Christ even more. There you have a cycle. There's something cyclical. The more we truly enjoy the Lord, the more we will have inner peace. And the more we have peace, arbitrating, governing uh, us, the result is we will enjoy the Lord more. So you now can understand why Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, excuse me, chapter 2, when he told uh, uh, Timothy uh, to uh, exhort the church where he was, to first of all pray, to pray with petitions, with uh, intercessions, with thanksgiving for kings and for those in power and for all men, uh, so that, so that what? So that, it says here, we can lead a quiet and tranquil life in godliness and gravity. You see, Paul charged uh, Timothy to uh, and the saints to pray for leaders of countries, uh, for those who are in power, not just so that they have wisdom to rule, not just so that they do the right thing, no, but so that we can lead a quiet and tranquil life in godliness and gravity. What is that? That is simply the church life today in which we what? We express God. That's the meaning of godliness or godlikeness. When we are in a disturbed situation, when we are in a tumult, um, it's hard for us to what? To enjoy God and to express him. This was Paul's charge. And then the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, when he was about to leave the disciples, meaning to go to die on the cross, there in John, the Gospel of John, uh, in, chapter, uh, in chapter 14 to start, um, he was already predicting and telling his disciples what is going to happen, that he is going towards Jerusalem, to Jerusalem, and then he will be killed. He will be killed there. And so the disciples heard that, and they were, and here the Lord had come to Jerusalem, and he is even in that last night before his arrest with his disciples. So he would say something like this. Uh, let me find the verse. <clears throat> he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give you? Do not let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So the Lord, as he was about to leave them, he was concerned for them. 
and he left his peace with them. He gave his peace to them. Not the kind of peace we talk about in the world, you know, peace and love, right? Or what the United Nations are talking about uh, uh, to keep peace. Because that is something of the world, and that is not something real nor eternal. This is a peace from God himself. Uh, but the Lord said this, I don't want your heart to be troubled. I don't want you to be afraid. So I give my peace to you. And then he would say something further later on. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Dear brothers and sisters, remember this. There is no genuine peace outside of Christ. None. No. You may have some uh, temporary um, repose or, or rest, but not this kind of a peace that only can be found in him. In the world, you have affliction. The Lord did not lie. The Lord told them the truth, as I have said already. Many afflictions, all manners of suffering. But take courage, he said, I have overcome the world. Of course, here, talking to these disciples, he was particularly referring to the persecution that they were going to experience after the Lord's uh, ascension. And then remember this, the, uh, the night of the, the Lord's resurrection, the Lord died and the disciples saw, they were in fear, they were just absolutely scared. They were hiding in some upper room in Jerusalem, not knowing where the Lord went, whether he will really come again as he promised. And suddenly he appeared in John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And this is a very, very comforting uh, story, <clears throat> account. It was evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors were shut, of course. They were hiding. They were in fear of the Jews. And Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, what is the first word? Peace be to you. What they need, what the disciples needed the most was comfort, was peace from him. Peace be to you. Oh, I just enjoy these four words in these days from the Lord. Peace be to you. And then after they touch him and they, um, they saw him, his wounds, his um, pierced side and hands and so on, the Lord said to them again, peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Peace be to you. And after all of this, he then breathed into them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And I'd like to pause a moment here to talk about this Holy Spirit. That was actually he himself transfigured to become the pneumatic Christ, the life-giving spirit. He breathed himself as that Holy Spirit into them. Now, this spirit, the Lord promised very, very um, uh, solidly before he uh, went to the cross. And he said, I am going to send you another comforter, another comforter, another peace giver, another 
consoler, another intercessor. I have been with you on this earth for these um, three and a half years, but now I'm going to send you the spirit of reality. And he will be the paraclete in Greek. The paraclete, meaning the one who is alongside of us, someone alongside of us to plead our case, an advocate, an attorney, if you will, to speak for us, to defend us, to cover us, to advise us, to take care of us as this other or second comforter. So, brothers and sisters, today, although the Lord has long ago left us to go to the heavens, of course, we should know and believe ever since he had been praying and interceding on our behalf before God. That should be a great comfort to us. But he sent the Spirit, which is really himself in another form, in another form, into us, to be in us, to live in us, never to leave forever, forever. That spirit, that spirit is the comforter today. That spirit is the source of peace today. So what does this mean? This means don't look outside for peace. In fact, the more you look, the more you hear, the more you think, the less peace you have. And by the way, by the way, I would do want to encourage us. Yes, we need to know what's going on in the world. Yes, we should get the news. Yes, we should um, have some knowledge of what is happening in world affairs and in our society so that we know what is God's move today and how we should be and what are these times and days we live in. And so we know how to comport ourselves, how to behave ourselves, how we should live and walk as believers and as church people. Yes, we need that. But I would like to suggest we do not spend too much time doing that, as if every other minute we need to know what's going on over there, and this is happening, that is happening, because these things would have a way to give you unrest, to stir you up, to cause you to panic, to cause you to be in, in uh, uh, to be afraid. In other words, to disturb you, to cause you not be in a condition of peace and quietness before God. And when you're in that state, you can hardly enjoy the Lord. So I come now because of time <clears throat> um, and just 10 more minutes, I believe I have a few verses in the New Testament, concerning the God of peace, the God of peace. You may know these verses, but let me read them to you. Uh, chronologically, according to the books in the New Testament, the first is Romans 15.33. Now the God of peace will be with you all. Amen. Before Paul wrote the last chapter of Romans, uh, of greetings, and so forth. He had finished his epistle, uh, his message to the Romans. And the end of that was, now, after I have said all this, now, after I have revealed all of this, let the God of peace be with you all. Because it is the God of peace who will work these things out in you. It is God as peace and joy by us that his full salvation, especially his organic salvation, will what? Will be worked out in our lives. Not in a state of uh, unrest, 
but in a state of peace, peace in God, the peace of God, and the peace which is God. This is where we need to find ourselves to experience God's full salvation. And then at the end of the epistle, in the last chapter 16, verse 20, this famous verse, now the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Listen, brothers and sisters, it is not the God of war, not the God of power, uh, not the almighty and uh, uh, all able God. It is in fact the God of peace that will crush Satan. How about this? Dear brothers and sisters, today in our lives, if we want to defeat the enemy, if we want to crush Satan under our feet, we need peace. God of peace. So let this peace roll like a river. Let this peace fill us every day, every minute of our lives. Let this peace prevail in the church life. Let this peace right in the midst of personal suffering, all manners of human affliction. Let this peace rule and arbitrate. This peace will deal with the enemy. In fact, it will crush Satan. His head was crushed on the cross. Today, the God of peace will continue to crush him under our feet. This time, it is not just the Lord crushing Satan. This time is his feet. That means his body dealing Satan the death blow again. Peace means the war is over. Peace means victory is won. Peace means Christ is on the throne. Peace means the church is seated with him in the heavenlies. When we enjoy the peace in that position, Satan will be crushed shortly. And then we come to Philippians. Paul says, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. What are these things? These things are all the virtues of Christ. In other words, Paul is talking about live Christ. You know, Philippians is a book about living Christ. Practice these things, these te teachings that I have been, exhortation, admonition that I've been giving to you in my writings. Practice them. And that's what we're doing in the church today. Am I right, brothers and sisters? In the church life, we are just practicing these things. And as we practice, the God of peace will be with us. Don't we believe that? The God of peace will be with you. And I'm not just talking about the outward environment. I'm talking about an inward Rest, inward quietness, and inward tranquility as we practice the church life today. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, we all know this verse, and the God of peace sanctify you wholly, that your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as we, brothers and sisters, wait for the Lord's appearing as we are here anticipating his return. And as we are here experiencing his sanctifying work in us, saving us to the uttermost, it is the God of peace who will ultimately preserve us complete and whole, quantitatively, qualitatively, in every way, 
until the Lord's coming. Let us, let us take this verse as ours. Let us believe this verse, this word. It is the sanctifying God, the sanctifier himself is actually the God of peace. Hebrews 13, 20, now the God of peace, he who brought up from the dead the Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. Today, my brothers and sisters, how is this peace dispensed to us, rendered to us? It is through that shepherding of by the great shepherd. We're all the sheep. We're all the flock. And today, the great shepherd who is in the heavens is also the very personal shepherd living in us. Psalm 23. My, read that psalm again and pray read it. You just will feel the God of peace shepherding you, restoring your soul being present with you even as you pass through the valley of shadow of death, that you will not fear evil. Your soul will be restored, so much so that we can even enjoy a feast set before us in front of our enemies. And we will be followed by goodness and mercy into the house of the Lord forever. All this, all this, by this great shepherd, the overseer of our souls, the God of peace. And finally, 2 Corinthians 13, 11, Finally, brothers, rejoice, be perfected, think this, the same thing, be at peace. Be at peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. So this is my enjoyment I like to share with you. In these days, flee to the God of peace, cleave to the God of peace, remain in the presence of the God of peace, and let him give us peace, and let him be our peace in every environment, in all kinds of sorrows, uh, under all kinds of threatening situation, in every kind of adversity, in our lives, in the church life, in our families, in every situation. Let us be perfected in this way. And finally, with the uh, remaining one minute or two, I must read uh, Philippians chapter four. This does not say the God of peace, but the peace of God, which really is the same thing. Philippians four, six and seven, in nothing be anxious. Anxiety can really ruin the day. Brothers, the great thing that we have to overcome as overcomers is to overcome the anxieties of this life. But in everything, it means everything, everything, big things, small things, personal things, corporate things by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. What a promise here. Just make requests to God. Just cast our cares upon him, for he cares for us, Peter says. Not only with prayer, not only with asking and petition, but even with thanksgiving. Because when we believe what we, we have received, what we pray for, we will have received it already. And that is a cause of thanksgiving.
and the peace of God, which surpasses every man's understanding. There's a kind of peace that passes understanding. You don't understand it. It's inexplicable. You shouldn't be so peaceful, but you are so peaceful. You shouldn't be so quiet, but you are so quiet and tranquil. You shouldn't be so undisturbed, but you are. And that's not a psychological thing. This is not gritting your teeth. This is not being deluded, you know, or think good things, think positive. No, it is the peace of God, the God of peace that surpasses every man's understanding, guarding, garrisoning, patrolling our hearts and our thoughts in Christ Jesus. This prayer that Paul told us to pray here is a counterpoise, a counterpoise, a counterpoise to all the troubles and the antidote to our anxiety. Whatever you're facing, brothers and sisters, right now, you can do this. You can come to the Lord. You can pray. You can petition. You can give him thanks. You can make your requests known to him. And the peace of God will what? Will patrol. Will mount guard over our minds, our hearts, our thoughts, keeping us in a calm and tranquil state. In which state? In which state? We enjoy grace, we experience Christ, and we express God. Isn't this what the Lord wants? That we would be the very expression of God today? So let the world swirl around. Let all the things happen. But we will keep our eye on God. We will keep our eyes on his will, his purpose, and his economy. We will keep our eyes on Christ and on the Spirit. We will keep our eyes on his reappearing. <clears throat> so I just want to end here. I'm sorry I took an extra five minutes. I, I think the brothers should forgive me uh, because I don't do this often. Dear ones, grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.